Let's ask for the Lord's help. Lord, as we come before your word, Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes to behold the wonders, the glories that are here revealed. Lord, make us humble. Help us to receive your word. Lord, help us to see what changes are needed in our life, what we need to do in light of this text. Lord, work in us even now. Help us to be attentive. Help us to be rightly thrilled by the truth of your word. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. The title of my message is Give Thanks to the Lord. So think with me, what is it that Christians do? What actions characterize what it means to be one of the people of God? What verbs get at the essence of being a Christian? Well, Psalm 100, in many ways, is God's answer to those questions. This short little psalm paints a picture of the people of God. It shows us what we're supposed to look like, what we should be characterized by. So hear now the word of the Lord, Psalm 100. This is God's holy Perfect, inerrant, infallible word. A psalm for giving thanks. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. This is the word of our God. Thanksgiving is a common theme in the book of Psalms. We're continually being called to give thanks to the Lord. So Psalm 30, verse 4 says, Sing praises to the Lord, O you His saints. Give thanks to His holy name. And there's so many other psalms that call us to that same action. Psalm 118 has the word thanks in it more than any other psalm. And it's bracketed with matching words. So verse 1 is, O give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And then the end of the psalm, again in verse 29, says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. So again and again, the scripture tells us, commands us to give thanks, to be filled with gratitude to the Lord. But Psalm 100 is unique in that it's the only psalm that is titled as such. Now, if you look at your Bible with me, you'll notice Um, your edition of the Bible, like mine, probably has titles. So I have the ESV, and above each psalm, there is a a title that's in italics and bold. It says, His steadfast love endures forever. Often they just take something from the psalm and make that the title. But underneath that title, that has just been added by the publishers, there is what's referred to as the superscription. This is, in my Bible, it's in all caps, It is the divinely inspired title. This is actually part of Scripture. It says, a psalm for giving thanks. The author of the psalm gave us the title. He's telling us that that's what this is. This is a psalm of thanksgiving. So every verse is related to giving thanks to the Lord. Now, I think understanding the structure of the psalm will help us see its emphasis, the the main point. So, like much poetry, it's split up into stanzas. Psalm 100 has four of them. So verses 1 and 2, that's the first stanza. Then the Bible has a, has a little break. There's, there's an extra space showing us, okay, this is the next stanza. Verse 3 and 4 and 5 are each their own stanza. Now, these four are really two pairs. What he's doing is he's making the same point twice. So the first stanza, verses 1 and 2, uh, they go with... Verse 4. Likewise, verse 3 and verse 5. It's this repetition. 
And, and what's being emphasized in this repetition? Well, it's simply this, that we should give thanks and praise to God because of who he is and what he has done. Let me say that again. We should give thanks and praise to God because of who he is and what he has done. That's, that's the point. So let's, let's consider it together. Let's think about what Christians are to do. We're to give thanks and praise to God. In the first two verses, we're called to thank God, to praise God with our words, with our actions, and with one another. So verse 1 says, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. All the tone-deaf people love this verse of Scripture, right? Because it doesn't say that we have to sing beautifully. We have to make a joyful noise. Um, Now, singing beautifully is a wonderful thing. It's appropriate. Uh, This text really just means to, to shout loudly to the Lord. To proclaim his greatness. Now there are places in the Psalms where we're called to be still and know that he is God. But this psalm is not one of them. This psalm is saying, crank up the volume. Praise God with loud voices. Celebrate it. Shout to the Lord. There's more in verse 1. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Everyone. And all of creation is supposed to praise the Lord. He is our maker. God is calling all of creation, every person, to give him praise. He is indeed worthy of that praise from all people. The next commands there in verse 2, serve the Lord with gladness. Now we need to be careful with this. We could, we could get the wrong idea here. Uh, the scripture is clear that we can't serve God in the sense of helping him out, doing him a favor. God has no needs. He doesn't need us to help him with anything. And yet the scripture does use this language of service, not because we're we're providing something that God is lacking, but it's just simply a way of describing what we do for the Lord. We do to honor him. So think with me, what does the Bible call us to do for God? Well, we're supposed to do Everything for God. Our whole life is to be lived out in joyful worship. This is a theme that comes up again and again. Let me just give you some quotes from the New Testament. So Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Everything we do is supposed to be for the Lord. Or 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whatever you do, do everything to the glory of God. Or Romans 12. He says, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So we worship God with all of life. One more verse. Colossians 3, 23. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, for you are serving God. The Lord Christ. So there is a sense in which we serve the Lord. We're not helping Him, but what we're doing is we're honoring Him with our actions. So this psalm has called us to use our our words to give thanks and praise to God and our our very actions. And then finally in this stanza, the the second half of verse 2 says, Come into His presence with singing. Here we're called to worship God with one another. It's a call to this very gathering, a gathering of the people of God to worship the Lord. Come into his presence with singing. Uh, We've seen recently in the book of Ephesians that God dwells in the midst of his people. So when we gather together, we are coming into the presence of the Lord in a, a special way. This is what this psalm long ago has been calling the followers of God, to do for millennia. Listen to Ephesians 5, verse 19. We're commanded to address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christianity commands us to sing. You have to sing. But the Lord, he has put a song in our hearts. He has given us reason to rejoice. 
He calls us to sing with, with gladness, to sing loudly. Some people we wish maybe weren't singing so loud. I know that happens at times. You can be distracted here and there. But brothers and sisters, isn't it a joy to not sing by yourself, but to sing and hear the voices of others as we together worship the Lord? Uh, What a sweet blessing that the Lord gives us to be able to sing together. So just looking at this first stanza, think to yourself, does this describe you? Do you sing to the Lord? Do you raise your voice? Do you live in such a way as to honor the Lord in your actions? Do you make it a point to gather with the people of God? Do you come to worship? Is this a description of our church? It should be. So we are commanded to give thanks and praise to God. And now we're given a reason. Because we know who God is and what God has done. And yet this is actually another command. No, we must know who God is and what he commands, what he's done. Uh, In some respect, verse 3 is just helping us to focus in on who we're thanking. So look at verse 3. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. So this Thanksgiving, our family sat down to watch a little bit of basketball. And uh, I don't know if it was at halftime or right before the game, but at some point they had some interview with a bunch of the athletes. And they were all speaking about things that they're thankful for. It seemed appropriate. Uh, but they, they all started the same way. They've probably been given this line, you know. I'm thankful to basketball for. And then they listed their education, their getting to travel, all these different things. Uh, But there's something there that, that, that saddened me. They're not thanking the Lord. They're thanking basketball. See, that's that's what our culture does. We're okay with Thanksgiving as long as it's just giving thanks to someone or something. But the whole point of Thanksgiving is actually to thank God. That that is what we're supposed to be doing, and that's what this psalm is calling us to do, to know who we're thanking. We're called to know who God is and what he has done. Uh, First of all, this draws our attention to the fact that God is the creator. You need to know that God made you. Look again at the verse. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We should be thankful that we even exist. God didn't have to make us, but he did. God made the whole world in which we live. He is our creator. Oh, we have reason to give thanks in the fact that God is our maker. Listen to the worship in heaven. This is Revelation 4.11. Worthy are you, O Lord, our God, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. The fact that God is our maker is plenty of reason for worship, for praise, for thanksgiving. But of course, there is a problem. It was read earlier in the service from Romans chapter 1. We don't give God the thanks and the honor that he deserves. So again, Romans 1 verse 18 The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. See, God deserves to be honored and to be thanked. And we know it. And yet we suppress that knowledge. Mankind is just ignoring God. They're not giving him the praise and the thanks that he rightly deserves as our our maker, as our authority. This is the big problem in the world, that we have sinned against God, that rather than living unto his glory, we have lived for ourselves. 
Rather than acknowledging all that he has done for us, we act as if we can do it all by ourselves. We worship ourselves rather than worshiping God. Well, this leads us to the second thing we need to know about God. We need to know that he's our creator, but we need to know him as savior. And that too is in our text. Look again. Verse 3 says, Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Oh, when He's referred to as as our shepherd, there's there's great hope here for us. You see, the, the fact that we are His people, the sheep of His pasture, is pointing back, alluding to Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love shall follow me all the days of my life. That psalm is being spoken by someone who's in relationship with God, who knows that God is caring for them. God has protected them. The scripture speaks of his people as his flock again and again. Shepherds do all kinds of things for the sheep. They provide for the sheep. They protect the sheep. They feed the sheep. But in John chapter 10, Jesus takes this shepherd imagery to a whole new level. Here's what Jesus says. John 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep. The wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Again and again, Jesus, alluding to the fact that Yahweh calls himself the shepherd of Israel, he says, That's actually me. I am the God of your fathers. I am your shepherd. I am the best of all shepherds in that I lay down my life for my sheep. He says it again and again and again. Knowing God as our Savior is our only hope. It's the only way to deal with our sin problem. Jesus laid down his life for his sheep. It's the best news in the world. Isaiah writes, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So there's the problem. We are straying sheep. We're all doing our own thing. Instead of following the Lord, we're going our own way. And yet the shepherd took our sin upon himself and died in our place. Jesus' death was a substitutionary death. He died in our place. In our stead. He died so that we didn't have to. This is above and beyond what any normal shepherd would do. Jesus said, I will take the worst of you and lay it upon myself. And I'll take all my righteousness, the best of me, and I'll lay it upon you. This is this incredible exchange. Our sin taken away. His righteousness given to his sheep. But who are his sheep? These these people that Jesus died for. Well, Jesus makes it really clear a little later in John chapter 10. Verse 27, he says this. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Who are the sheep? In God's flock, it's those who hear his voice and respond. It's those who follow the shepherd. Have you turned away from your straying 
to follow the shepherd of your soul? Have you turned away from your sin and put your trust in Jesus? This is the only hope for sinners. Peter writes, 1 Peter 2, 25, We were all straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of our souls. There's nothing better than being in the flock of God. Recognizing that God is not just my maker to whom I'm accountable, but he's my savior to whom I owe all the thanks and praise in the world. We should give thanks and praise to God because we know who he is and what he has done. As a church, our business is to know God better and better. This command of our text is know that the Lord, he is God. Uh, This is a big part of what we're doing when we gather together. Uh, Yes, we're praising the Lord, but we're also growing and learning. Every time we come before the Word, we're we're wanting to know Him more. Not long ago, we read a a, a book on our Wednesday Bible study by J.I. Packer, Knowing God. I, I commend it to you. It's an excellent book helping us take practical steps to grow in our relationship with God, grow in our knowledge of our King. The better we know Him, the more we will love Him, which will lead us to give thanks and praise to Him. So that's the point of Psalm 100. And yet He's not done. He says it again with two more stanzas. But the point is the same. Give thanks and praise to God. Verse 4 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. The word translated here as enter is actually the same Hebrew word that's up in verse 2 is come into his presence. We're literally being commanded to do the same thing. To, to come to the Lord. Come to gather and worship with the people of God. We're commanded specifically to give thanks to Him, to bless His name. God deserves our thanks. He deserves our praise. And we should notice that this psalm makes it clear that God is at the center of the universe. It all belongs to Him. Notice just in the psalm, just scan your eyes, what is referred to as the Lord's. What is His? It's His gates. The courts are His. The songs are His. The earth is His. We are His. So we should give him praise and worship. And we should always be doing so. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Lots of people are wondering, what is God's will for my life? Well, here's a verse that tells you. Thank God. (laughs) Keep thanking God. No matter what comes into your life, thank him. In every situation, there actually is plenty of reasons. To thank God. We just sang together how we count our blessings in good times and bad times. Because it leads us, it prepares our heart to relate to God rightly. With thanks and praise. And just as we saw before, not only are we commanded to give thanks and praise to God. But we're told why we should do it. The ground again is here in verse 5 just as it was in verse 3. Who God is and what he has done. So verse 5 says... The Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. His faithfulness to all generations. We should worship God because there's none like him. He is the best. And what he has done is astounding. Now, we're focused in here on three aspects of his character. We should worship and give thanks because God is good, God is love, and God is faithful. The goodness of God is a theme that comes up over and over again. The Psalms tell us that God is good to all. There isn't a person on the planet that God is not behaving in a benevolent way. He's doing them good. God is the one who who made us and sustains us. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Every breath that we receive is just God being kind to us, showing goodness to us. We should give thanks and praise because God is good. Likewise, we should give thanks and praise because God is love. In 1 John, the book that makes that statement so clearly that God is love, we read this in chapter 4, verse 9. 
And this is, in this, the love of God was made manifest among you. That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You see, the love of God is most clearly seen at the cross. Jesus came to be the propitiation for our sins. That's a big word that simply means that he came to satisfy the justice of God that was deserved because of our sin. Jesus paid it all. He he turned away the wrath of God by absorbing it himself for us. Oh, this is the love of God shown to us. Does God love me? Yes, I know, because Jesus died on the cross for me. The Bible makes it so clear. We should give praise and thanks to God because God is good, because God is love, and because God is faithful. Again, over and over again, God has made promises in the scripture, and we see that he is a promise-keeping God. We sing, great is thy faithfulness, because God really is faithful. He always does what he's promised. He's made lots of promises. We've seen them fulfilled, and there's still more promises that he made, and we know that he will fulfill them because this is who our God is, a God whose faithfulness endures to all generations. So what have we seen this morning? We've seen that knowing who God is and what he has done leads us to give thanks and praise to God. This is who the church is. We are joyful servants who gather to worship and give thanks to God. We are those who know God and want to know him more and more. We ought to give thanks. But sometimes we just don't feel like giving thanks. Sometimes everything seems to be going wrong. We don't want to praise the Lord. We want to complain. We want to kick the cat or something, right? What do you do in those situations? When everything that we were just commanded to do seems out of reach. What do we do when we don't feel thankful? Well, I think we go to the ground of this text. We go back to verse 3. Know that the Lord, He is God. We need to remind ourselves who God is and what He has done. So we need to read our Bible. We need to fill our minds with the truth about God. We need to talk with one another. We need to encourage each other. We need brothers and sisters in the Lord to to help us remember why we have so many reasons to be thankful and to praise. Uh, We need to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I can think of more than one occasion where I was grumpy, but it was time for church. And so I got there and we began to sing. And in the act of singing, my, my heart was just lifted. I was reminded of what God has done for me. And all the things I was grumpy about began to fade away. It is good For us to respond to the call to come and worship together. Brothers and sisters, we need to get in the practice of letting the scripture fill our hearts with thankfulness. If we don't feel thankful, we're not thinking rightly. We need to be thinking about who God is and what he has done. And then we will be led to worship and thanksgiving. We need to be those who intentionally meditate on our King. A true knowledge of God enables us to speak and to act as we ought with thanksgiving and praise. That's what the people of God do. Listen again to Psalm 100. Hear it not as much of a duty as the privilege that that it is. Everything in this psalm is a gift to us. Christians are called to make a joyful noise to the Lord. All the earth, serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. So enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. And why should we do so? Because the Lord is good and his steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness just keeps going and going and going to all generations.
Let's pray together. Lord, we give you thanks. Lord, we thank you for all that you have done for us. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We give you the honor and the praise due to your name. Your greatness is beyond us. Who you are is absolutely beyond our comprehension. There's no one or nothing that can compare with you. And you have been so good to us. You've been so loving to us. You have faithfully kept your promises, especially in the gospel of Christ. You said you would send a rescuer, and you did it. Jesus came, and he satisfied the wrath of God for sinners, for unthankful people like us. And Lord, you did all of this to transform us into those who are filled with joy. You've made us into those who can sing loudly to our God, to those who want to serve you with all that we are. Lord, we can look back at our life and see the transformation. We see what you have done in our life. And Lord, we give you thanks. Lord, we celebrate your faithfulness to us. And Lord, it is with eager expectation that we look forward to the fulfillment of the rest of your promises. We know that you are faithful. And so we delight in it. Thank you, Lord. Amen.